to come rest of these, I'm not preaching. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. <laughs> not him again. No, I just praise the Lord. Um, today, let me introduce Renee, wrestler in the wrestler family. Uh, those who don't know, they were a part of the Abundant Life Church Plant. Um, Charter members. Charter members to start our church. And uh, I have a lot of fond memories because at that time, I got to teach their children <laughs> in youth. And uh, my, how time flies. Yes. And uh, I just really enjoyed the wrestler family. Um, they are serving faithfully now in the Wenatchee Church. Um, we had a fun surprise at Christmas time in Spokane, Deer Park area. Anybody knows where Deer Park is outside Spokane? We were caroling Christmas carols and going house to house. We go to the fire station because we see that there's some cars parked out there. And go and we stand in front of the fire station and look inside and I'm like, I recognize that kid. <laughs> That's Eric Bressler, <laughs> your son. And he got a full time job, praise the Lord, working for the Deer Park Fire Station. Yes. But it was a lot of fun to see him and sing to him and the guys that were with him. And uh, I just uh, uh, I appreciate also the spiritual connection of the Bressler family, you know, and the conversations over the years with their kids and them. And so I. I know the Lord is bringing um, their hearts and we look forward to the message that Renee will bring us today. And thank you for coming uh, to share with us. The Lord be with you. Thank you, Alex. So 2024, we had our first meeting at High School. <coughs> in February of 2004. And the reason I know that is because it was Paul's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that he just passed that anniversary. It is a pleasure to be back here and to see so many familiar faces and to see so many new faces. This is amazing. And to see how God has blessed You're the one who asked me to speak, so. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever traveled to a destination and arrived at that village? Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I haven't experienced that. I have only lost my luggage on the way home, which is a lot more convenient than losing it when you're on your way somewhere. No one wants to arrive at a vacation or a business seminar or a big family event without the proper clothing or the shoes or clean underwear or, in my case, moisturizer. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have of always being able to open up your word, to hear your voice, and to feel your spirit. And so I ask for your help, Lord, to calm the nerves and to simply speak what you have been teaching me. May your name be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In addition to losing luggage, we also talk about our baggage. Well, mostly we talk about other people's baggage. <laughs> But you know, the stuff, the memories, the traumas, the habits that we carry with us, and by which, really, we hope to excuse our bad behavior. Or just an excuse to not engage. The truth is, we all have baggage. But the question is whether you are choosing what you're packing, or you're just dragging along the old stuff and not paying attention. When I pack for a trip, I take what's comfortable, what's appropriate for the planned activities. 
I pack also to be prepared for some unexpected changes in weather or events. I might take hiking sho shoes and binoculars. I also might take heels and a dress, depending on where we're going and what we're doing. But there's always the basics, you know? There's the toiletries and the vitamins, and there's the jeans and the PJs. <coughs> the basics prepare me to be able to adapt. The basics are the foundation of everything else. The basics are familiar, they're comfortable, and they fit me. They are the starting point for being ready for the day. Earlier this year, I was reading through Paul's letters to Timothy. The lovely thing about reading a book in the Bible in a women's group is you get to just go slowly. You take one chapter a week. And you get to just kind of soak it in. Now, admittedly, I'm a very subjective thinker when I study the Bible. If it's written in here, then I firmly believe it has something to say to you. Perhaps it doesn't all speak to my life today, or this month, or this year, but I plan on living, I don't know, maybe another 30 years. And Lord knows I've already made it through how many different seasons already. The counsel, the law, the gospel, the examples, the warnings, they are applicable to me. It's not just objective facts of history. These letters to Timothy are intimate. They are the mentoring of father to son. They are the encouragement and the instruction to a young man with a lot of responsibility. And they are worth taking a moment to absorb. While reading Paul's letters to Timothy, I noticed a repeated phrase that I haven't paid attention to before. The goal of their teaching to the members in Ephesus was love from a pure heart, a good conscience and a sincere faith. This phrase, or parts of it, appear multiple times in the first letter to Timothy. Were these the items, the basics that you would need to prepare you for the day and for any need to adapt? Paul loved Timothy. He was special to Paul. This young man was raised by a believing mother and grandmother. He knew the word of God, and he served him. But he was convicted of the gospel, probably on Paul's first missionary journey through Lystra. And Timothy grew in reputation as a faithful follower of Christ. When Paul returned a second time to Lystra, Timothy agreed to join Silas and Paul on his missionary journey. And his, agree his uh, commitment was so great that he even agreed to be circumcised. Knowing that as they were traveling around and speaking to the Jewish community, they would not listen to the young man who was not circumcised. So he made that commitment. And this young man proved to be a faithful partner on their journey. He spent days, I mean, I kind of I kind of have to be envious, right? He spent days and weeks and months walking the roads in the company of Paul and Silas, joining them in teaching the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Now, he is known to be more timid than Paul. I'm not sure you will find very many who were bolder than Paul. Um, and based on some of the counsel in Paul's letters to him, he was self-conscious, or at least sensitive, about his youth. He had maybe received some criticism from the more elderly in the church. But Paul loved him like a son in Christ, and he continued to mentor him according to the pattern that had been set before him by the Lord. They had laid hands on him. And Paul reminded Tim not to miss 
collect that home. I have a quote to that. I'm always nervous to declare that because it, it kind of makes it sound like I'm an expert, which I am not. But I quilt. I need to <coughs> And when I begin the process of a flimsy, which is the top, that's the piece part of the quilt, I start with a pattern. Or I might start with a collection of fabrics that have caught my eye and appeal to my aesthetic. Either way, I start with something. And there, but there are decisions to be made before I make that first cut. I need to read through the pattern completely before I ever start to cut anything. And then I need to cut those people, those pieces, <laughs> accurately, not the people. Um, then I need to follow the instructions to sew the blocks together properly. I need to measure accurately. And then I need to follow the instructions again to assemble the whole book correctly. Then I need to decide, do I stash it? Do I border it? Then there's a backing to be made. And then you cut the batting, and then you sandwich them all together, and then they, then they are quilted together. But still you're not finished. Because then, it has to be squared up. Because for most of us, our quilts are rectangular, or they're square. They are not parallel or <laughs> So we square them up. And then you bind the edges so they don't grow. And lastly, I make a simple label that states the date and identifies the use of those. Now our lives don't quite follow a pattern like quilting does. But we do have a progression, don't we? And I certainly hope that your life in Christ is not the same today as it was 20 years ago. Surely you've discovered fresh stories in this world and learned something from it. Surely you have new perspectives because His Spirit has softened you. I hope that you are changed even since last year. Timothy had grown from new convert to an evangelizing companion. And now Paul has instructed him to leave the church at Ephesus. That's quite a promotion. That's quite a road. It was a tremendous calling for a valiant. And Paul wrote these letters to encourage Timothy in his own faith. And that's what I think the verses this morning are about. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. If I were to translate that into Renee's substandard version, don't forget words don't forget what I've done. <laughs> Last fall, I found myself uh, studying in too many groups. And, um, and I just felt like I was clicking off the reading list for this one and that one and this one and that one. And I just felt cheated that I wasn't getting that time for personal life. So I needed to slow down a bit. Quit one of the groups. And that's how I ended up digging into Timothy's letters. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much Timothy meditated on the word. He doesn't. Paul doesn't talk about that. But it is a biblical name. And they had hours of walking the roads on their journeys their missionary journeys, right? He had Paul and Silas to discuss and examine and ask questions, and I'm thinking he chewed on the word a lot. And I need to give it more. 
So I decided to get back focusing a little bit more on meditating. And um, when I think of the word meditate, I think of chewing. I honestly picture a Jersey cow. <laughs> I don't think I learned that in Sunday school. <laughs> Growing up. But that's what I think is a cow. And most definitions, if you look up meditation, include to chew, to memorize, to mull over, to visualize, to personalize God's word. Now the first mention of the word meditate is way back in Genesis 26. That's Isaac meditating in the field before he lifts his eyes and sees the caravan he's carrying his back. But I want to look at the word meditate in Joshua. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. The translation of the word used for meditate in Joshua 1 8 is to think out loud the word of God. That was, for me, I often read God's word out loud. To keep the mind saturated with truth for a proper answer. I love also the word of being saturated in God's word. I want it into my home into the very cells of my body. And I want it there so that I can respond to life, to you, to God. Do you notice, too, that this instruction does not promise that if you meditate, I will make your way prosperous? It says, if you meditate, you will be careful to do what is right and you will make your way prosperous. We hide God's word in our hearts so it influences all of us, our relationships, the choices, the priorities. It gets sifted through a purification process of a renewed heart and cleansed mind. That's evidence of a transformed heart. Yeah. So when we read and we memorize and we sing and we meditate on God's word with the hope and the intention of hiding that wisdom and instruction in our lives. I may not be able to stand here today and regurgitate what I've memorized. But it's in there. And the Holy Spirit brings it to mind. He has promised us that he will do that. I'm sure all of us have had conversations with somebody where a word fitly spoken was brought by the Holy Spirit. So I've, ta I've started taking more time to chew and mull over the principles and the stories and the memorized passages to hide them in my I want there to be resources for the Holy Spirit to pull up when I'm living my life, which is my mission. Now, when I go to a quilt retreat, I may forget to pack a ruler that I can or the right color of the bed, and chances are that there's someone there that I can borrow some of those tools. And even if my pattern is a challenge, there's somebody who knows more than I who can walk me through a technique. Or they'll know a YouTube instructor that they'll, you know, that I can sit and watch YouTube and figure out how to do something. But I can't go and finish my project by borrowing somebody else's pattern. And I can't stop my pattern in the middle and swap with one of them. 
each project has a design to be followed if I'm going to achieve the expected result. I want to be following the design of God in my life. Mm -hmm. The late Tim Keller wrote, I worry because I forget your wisdom. I resent because I forget your mercy. I covet because I forget your beauty. I sin because I forget your holiness. I fear because I forget your sovereignty. <coughs> you always remember me. Help me always remember you. Paul did not want Timothy to lose sight of his mission with worry or resentment or hidden sin or fear that he wasn't old enough or bold enough. He wrote to encourage Timothy to stick with his foundation, to always pack the gospel of grace along with whatever else might be needed. Ephesus was what we would now call the metropolitan city. Not just in population, but it was a crossroads for trade in this community. This community would have been extremely diverse in race, in culture, business, in religion. There was a lot going on in Ephesus. And Paul wanted Tim to be ready for the day. He was going to need to be ready to adapt to the demands of the community and the needs of the church. And he starts out right away in the very first chapter of the first letter, urging him to instruct men to not be teaching strange doctrines. Don't be confused or diverted, Timothy, by the multitude of ideologies and doctrines and musings of a philosophical crowd. How easy and alluring it can be to speculate on this theory or that and lose the very simplicity of the gospel. So he lays it out. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart a good conscience, and a sincere faith. It always comes back to your relationship with Jesus. The only way we get purity and goodness is through Christ. There is a clarifying work that is done by God in the call of grace. And sincere faith it requires trusting something outside of yourself, something bigger. So he says, keep everything centered on the one who does these things for you to me. This is your message. These letters are reminders of the lessons that Tim learned while on missionary journeys with Paul. There isn't any new teaching. You'll find similar teaching of everything that's in 1st and 2nd Timothy in Acts or in his other letters to other churches. But he is reminding Tim of what he knows. These are words of clarity and encouragement to heart challenges and critics <coughs> don't negate. Paul reminds him also, and I think this is so beautiful, very first chapter of 1 Timothy, that the, the same blood of Christ that purifies Timothy's heart and cleanses his conscience did that work on Paul. He called himself the chief among sinners. By reminding Timothy of his own rough start, Paul was teaching this young man that a good conscience is freedom before God. Verses 12 through 15 of chapter 1, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me. Because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy, because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and the love which I found in Christ Jesus. A man who could have moped around with regrets, 
or hidden away with shame. Instead, he took God at his word and carried with him an incredible personal experience of the redeeming grace of God. Paul was a changed man, so changed that his ministry expanded beyond the Jews to that include the hated Gentiles. This is not the Paul before conversion. Timothy was called to be an evangelist. He was a teacher of the gospel. And his youth and his tenderness might have been seen as a handicap by some in the congregation, maybe even by Timothy himself at some moments. But not to God. Not to God. <coughs> he knew exactly who Timothy was and what could be accomplished through Timothy if he stayed in Christ. Paul just wanted to remind him to pack the right tools, to keep the basic tools on hand all the time. He wanted Timothy to do what he did to the best of his ability, which is all that God ever asks us to do, and to help others do the same. God has plans for you, and there's a pattern in your life he wants the gospel shared and lived out. I appreciate your testimony this morning, Alex, of the opportunities that appear at work. God wants to share the gospel through you, just by who you are and how you live your life. Keep moving through all the stuff that life throws at you, and don't be derailed by other speculations. Um, Paul puts it in um, chapter 4, verse 10, worldly fables fit only for old women. I should be offended by that or not, but um, <laughs> he tells us to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. For it is for this we labor and strive. Because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of all believers. Don't neglect your spiritual gift, Paul advises. He could be telling us the same today. Keep teaching the law properly. Set up community services to keep the widows cared for and in useful service. Train up deacons and elders, mentor the workers, confront unsound doctrine, beware of money as temptation, instruct, preach the word, be strong. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called, and to which you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Stick to the basics. Now, Truly, I have a gift of overpacking. Paul has given up suggesting that we take care of ons um, And as I prepare for retreats, I think I am going to somehow, on those four days, transform into Superman. And so I pack so many projects and supplies, my car is filled to the brim. And while it's not unusual for me to sew for eight or ten hours a day at a retreat, there's also time to eat and talk and share, maybe even shed a tear or two, and do show and tell, catch up with friends that I haven't seen for months. But just like my eyes can be bigger than my stomach at potluck, I can be far too optimistic when I pack for a quilt retreat. I'm determined to cut out two brand new projects, sew four tops, sandwich one quilt, finish binding on another, and whip up six pillowcases in four days. <laughs> and I'm sure there's someone out there who can do all that, but it's not. Unfortunately, I have done the same thing in my spiritual life. By taking God's calling and loading up my own agendas and good ideas, and taking off at a trot and leaving God out of the plan altogether. When I pack for a retreat with 
plans to create, I need the right tools. When I pack for a trip, I need the right tools. When I think of living as a woman of God, I also need the right tools. If life is a journey, then I want my bag packed with those few foundational pieces that will keep me ready for whatever the day brings. The most important, of course, is Jesus. His brother, his friend, but mostly Jesus my Savior. And I want to take along with me the transformation that he has already brought in. He takes my sorrow and my repentance and he removes my He sends me his spirit and gives me opportunities to grow. He takes my best efforts and he invites me into his yoke with his power and grace to lead. He cleans me up, powers me up, and he sends me out. That is what Paul is trying to get through to take. He's going to have a lot of his place a lot of responsibility, and probably a lot of resistance. But motivated in it all, by motivating all of it, I should say, he wants to me to remember what Christ accomplished in him. The goal of our instructions has to be what we know already. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere This phrase, of course, has been repeated three or four times in this first letter from Paul. I think these phrases were certainly familiar and meaningful to this young man. Maybe it was their own personal phraseology, if you will. Pack up your gospel experience and share it with others. Both the graces and the corrections, you have a living experience of the love of God in heart and mind and soul. And that is what prepares you to go out and love others into God's way. God's people pack the grace of God and then move forward. To paraphrase Paul, find contentment as you pursue godliness. And love in the freedom of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. It is for <coughs> this that we labor and strive. Because we have fixed our hope in the living God. He is the Savior of all men, especially of the